Thank you so much for coming. My name is Ute Ritz Deutsch. I teach in the history department here, and my expertise is uh, human rights. So I work on human rights both academically and also outside of the classroom. So for me, the uh, starting premise is one, that human rights are important, that all people in the world uh, deserve and actually have human rights, and that if uh, governments are violating human rights that they need to be held accountable. So my talk today is going to be on drones and in particular drone warfare and extrajudicial killings. So the word drone just by itself means unmanned aircraft. There are several acronyms, unmanned aerial vehicle, unmanned area, aircraft system, remotely piloted aircraft, and so on. It basically means an airplane without a pilot. Now, drones are used in a variety of ways. So for example, if there's a forest fire out west, they may send a drone in to figure out exactly what the extent of the fire is. Gathering intelligence, taking aerial pictures. Uh, they're also used for surveillance, as in uh, spying. And drones can certainly be used to deliver weapons, such as missiles and a whole range of other weapons. Uh, drones come in all sizes and price tags. And the reasons why we're using drones, and I'm not necessarily saying that these are good reasons, but the reasons why we're using drones is that a drone generally costs less than an airplane. And since the killing is done remotely, so someone who's in control of a drone may be sitting uh, somewhere here in the United States and will have, you know, computer console, joystick, and so on. They're going to be thousands of miles away from where the killing actually takes place. So in that sense, for the soldiers, for U.S. soldiers, it's less of a danger of getting killed. But I would also like to add that in terms of the psychological damage, that that is significant, right? So even uh, the people working for the military who do have control of that button and then see what happens you know, after a strike and after uh, people are killed, uh, nonetheless have to deal with that psychologically, and many of them do suffer from post-traumatic stress. Drones are looking to kill, not capture people. So when Obama first took office, uh, he wanted to close Guantanamo. He knew that internationally Guantanamo is a big problem. And the world is watching us, right? The world is watching whether or not uh, we torture people, whether or not we hold people indefinitely. So Guantanamo was a real problem. Well, if you have drone strikes, and especially if you keep those drone strikes secret, then those people who are killed are not going to be in Guantanamo complaining, and their lawyers are not going to be complaining. Right? So in that sense, the, the method has shifted, right? but the, the, the problem is still very much uh, a, a similar problem. There seems to be, at least up to this point, public support for the use of drones, and again, having to do with the fact that US soldiers are not going to be killed during a, a, a drone strike. Uh, historically, drones have been used since the 1970s, but we've had made uh, significant advances in the 1990s. Not surprisingly, the U.S. is in the business of manufacturing and selling weapons, so also when it comes to drones, the U.S. is the largest producer of drones. Uh, President Obama first ordered a drone strike three days into his presidency. And at that point, instead of striking a Taliban hideout, the strike killed a member of the local pro-government peace committee and four of his family members. In other words, this was a guy on our side. It should really have gotten us to pause and think. Right? Domestically, drones are definitely used already. Um, we have drones on the border with Mexico. And if you take a look at the cost of using the drones and the analysis, you know, the drones gather a tremendous amount of material. You need about nine analysts per drone. So the cost is of operating is actually higher than just the cost of manufacturing drones. So average cost of catching an undocumented immigrant is $7,000, which seems like a pretty hefty price tag. Drones are also used by police departments. They're used for domestic spying. 
and there have been concerns about drones already cluttering domestic airspace and therefore interfering with, let's say, domestic flights you know, of airplanes that are carrying passengers. When it comes to drone strikes abroad, let's say in Afghanistan, Pakistan, or elsewhere, there are generally two different types of strikes. A personality strike means that the person we're looking for is on a so-called kill list. So these are people who end up on the kill list are supposedly terrorists or people who really pose a threat uh, to the United States. The other type of strike is a signature strike. So, you know, you have analysts sitting in a room and looking at the computer screen and trying to analyze these images that come in every second, right? And trying to make a decision on what it means. What is it we're looking at? How can we interpret what we're looking at? So uh, the analysts then try to determine whether or not a situation is dangerous. And oftentimes what has happened is a decision is made that as soon as you have a gathering of people, that that's considered dangerous. If, for example, you think of Afghanistan and Pakistan, the culture of those countries is that a lot of young men carry weapons, right, and, and even machine guns. So just by seeing a group of people who carry guns, you cannot necessarily say that these people are terrorists, right? So it gets very complicated, it gets very tricky trying to figure out who is truly dangerous and who is truly uh, a threat, especially to the United States. So the signature strikes uh, are based on certain signature behaviors, and that usually means gathering of people. So we've already had a number of drone strikes where you had people gathering for birthday parties or for weddings, and because it was a gathering of people, it was interpreted that that was dangerous, and then you have an entire wedding party obliterated. Drones, as I already mentioned, can carry a wide range of weapons, and that includes nuclear. Right? It, you, you can put uh, chemical, biological weapons on drones. You, you can do anything with a drone. So one of the problems that we have is if the United States uses drones, uses drones massively, then how are we going to prevent other countries or non-countries, <clears throat> let's say, I mean, Al-Qaeda, for example, is not a country, right? Uh, how can we prevent those actors from getting their hands on drones and using them against us, right? So that's, that's a real, for me, that's a real issue. Uh, right now, 75 countries have drones. Uh, we, a few years ago, I think in Iran, they captured one of our drones. I mean, the technology is out there, right? And it's not uh, that difficult to, to build one. Technical problems. Because drones are gathering information. So drones have cameras, right? And they're taking pictures. It's a nonstop picture feed. We already have so much footage that just in order to analyze all the information that we've already gathered, it would take about nine years, right? So that's a real issue because what we're dealing with is tremendous information overload. Every drone requires nine analysts. And if you have all this information that you're gathering, it just makes it that much more difficult to sort through it and it makes it that much more difficult, again, to determine who the really dangerous people are. Another issue in terms of technological vulnerability has been that you're dealing basically with an um, unpiloted aircraft that has a computer, that has a camera feed, and is, is submitting data. And drones can be brought down by viruses, just as computers can be hacked into and, and crash. Uh, data can be intercepted. So we've had occasions, for example, where uh, in, in Iraq, uh, some groups who we consider uh, to be our enemies have gotten a hold of information that our drones have gathered, right? So uh, there's a con considerable s security issue here as well. Problems of identifying the enemy, right? How do we determine whether or not someone is an enemy? And again, enemy has been very loosely defined in, in places like Pakistan and Afghanistan to mean anybody, any male between the age of 15 and 70, right? Anybody with a beard? Well, okay, mo most men have beards in that region, or, or at least a lot of them do. Any gathering of three or more people or two or more people? 
You know, how can we assess that from thousands of miles away? Uh, another problem has been that the U.S. military pays about $100 for information, right? And then that information is used. So what has happened in the past often is someone with a grudge against somebody else is basically turning people in or is saying, you know, in this house is where you're going to find Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda supporters or Al-Qaeda sympathizers. It doesn't mean, just because somebody gives us a name, in and of itself doesn't mean that that person's really dangerous, right? And there's a real challenge to verify intelligence information. And if you're in a region where, they, you, you know, we've had war for a very long time, a lot of people are very impoverished, it doesn't take much of an imagination to say, to, to think that, okay, for $100, somebody who may be totally innocent could be turned over uh, to U.S. authorities or, you know, to people who then make a decision on drone strikes. So far, over 3,000 civilians have been killed by U.S. drone strikes since 9-11. More people than died on that day. And that's a real issue, right? Even though the administration is saying we're really only targeting the very dangerous criminals, Obviously, we have a lot of what the government refers to as collateral damage, right? We do catch some bad guys, and we do kill some bad guys, but if killing a bad guy means that we've also killed a dozen or two dozen of his family members who had nothing to do with Al-Qaeda, what does that do, right? What, what does that mean that we have this collateral damage? So we do have a lot of innocent civilians who have died, and obviously, those people have families who grieve. Not everybody deals with grief in the same way, but some people turn that into anger, some people turn that into hatred. I'm not saying everybody does, but it's understandable that that can happen. So another real problem for villagers is, and these villagers may not have been harboring Al-Qaeda for a lot of villagers, Al-Qaeda itself is a constant threat and if there was a drone strike, oftentimes what happens is the, the Taliban come down from the mountains into the village, and then they want to know who gave the information to the Americans. And in order to find that out, they often capture, torture, kill people, right? So for the villagers, often it's a double whammy. We have a U.S. drone strike, uh, and it, it, again, oftentimes it, it's innocent people we kill, and then on top of it, you get the retaliation. Now, I'm not saying that every single drone strike is against the law. So what I'm mostly concerned with in this talk are unlawful drone strikes, right? So for example, if you are in a theater of war, right? If, if there's a war happening, a war that is recognized by the international community, not just a war that we call war, but a war that is recognized, and if you are under attack, obviously you have the right to defend yourself. Right? But even in a theater of war, you're not allowed to go into a village and just butcher civilians if those civilians have never posed a threat to you. Right? So there are certain rules that apply uh, even, even during war. And with, with unlawful drone strikes, a lot of the rules are just not being followed. Uh, obviously, if we do have intelligence, and it's good intelligence that somebody is a threat, um, and if there's imminent danger, in other words, if we know that somebody's planning if an attack, if we have the emails, if we're intercepting the phone calls and so on, if there's an imminent threat, then the government, yes, has a right to try and, as the government puts it, quote unquote, neutralize people, which oftentimes means to kill people. But you, you have to realistically assess whether or not somebody is a threat. So privacy and accountability issues, Obviously, drones gather information on people without asking their consent first. And that's also for domestic spying, right? We, if a drone flies overhead, you're not being asked whether or not you're okay with that drone, you know, following your route, the route that you travel for that day or whatever. Um, drones that we use abroad obviously execute people without those people having a chance uh, to, to be taken to court, to defend themselves without the government presenting evidence that they ever were a threat, 
right? So it's, and, and that's why it's extrajudicial killing. It means these killings take place outside the law, right? It's, it's extrajudicial. There, there's a real problem with lack of accountability. If you have, and, and I honestly would not envy people who have this job, but if you have people who, who, again, sit in front of a computer screen, or usually you have multiple screens in one room, and, you know, have to make that decision whether or not something look, looks dangerous and whether or not to basically drop a bomb or a missile uh, on a village, that's a tremendous burden, right? And if you are mistaken, if you press that click button and then you killed innocent people, who's responsible for that, right? Is anybody going to be held accountable for that? Um, a lot of drone operations have been contracted out, and we've seen that that was a big problem in places like Iraq with Blackwater, for example. If you have these private defense contractors who are then operating, they're not operating by military code, and so they, there's a whole different lack of accountability and responsibility that happens when we contract warfare out, which, which is what we frequently do. And Needless to say, drones are big business, right? Especially uh, if, if you look at um, uh, military industrial complex, if you look at the big corporations who make money, there's definitely incentive to build more drones, to sell more drones, to use more drones. And we already have so many drones that the bottom line is drones are here to stay, right? We're, we're not gonna get rid of drones. We're gonna have to live with drones. And then the question becomes, how can we make sure that the drones are used in such a way that it complies with U.S. law, that it complies with the U.S. Constitution, and that it complies with international law, right? So it's not that drones in and of themselves are a problem, but it's the use of the drones and how we're using them and the lack of oversight that's been a real issue. And then also the secrecy uh, that you know the, the government engages in right we, we don't have all of the facts we don't know who's being killed we don't have the list of those names right uh, oftentimes drone strikes are carried out by the CIA and by the Joint Special Operations Command known as JSOC now JSOC is a special unit uh, responsible and accountable to the president only right so this direct line to the White House JSOC does not even operate within the regular military command structure, right? So you will have people in, in the Army, in the Navy, in the Marines, in the Air Force who are part of the military command structure who will not know what goes on with JSOC. Uh, JSOC was already operating under the Bush administration, but use of JSOC has really become a lot more prevalent under the Obama administration. And again, the secrecy is, is troubling. Um, as, as the name says, it's joint uh, operation, so you have different, you know, people from, from different branches involved in this. But with JSOC, right, that, uh, between JSOC and the CIA, that's where we get a lot of these kill lists. And the question is, well, how are these kill lists assembled? And the tragedy is that if we go down a kill list and we check off the names of all the people we kill, for every kill list we finish, we end up with 10 more kill lists or 100 more kill lists because of, of the enemies that we've made. So it's like a, a, a never-ending cycle and something that we really, really need to be concerned about. Of course, JSOC and, and the CIA claim that their activities are classified. So the public is not allowed to know about it. The administration has not explained the use and the limits of the program, and that, that's also been a real issue. So uh, in the very least, we, we need more public discussion. It's important to know how somebody ends up on a kill list, right? How does that happen? You know, what, what kind of, is, is there verification as we gather intelligence, and of course intelligence is not an exact science, but as we gather intelligence, what are the, the safety measures, right? Is, is anybody double checking this? Who is double checking this, right? So uh, it's the, the, the way the program runs right now, it is very secretive, and therefore we, as members of the public, just don't have the information uh, that, that we should have. 
In terms of legal questions, a very important question is, does the U.S. government have the right to kill U.S. citizens without giving them a trial? And if you look at the U.S. Constitution, at least last time I checked, there is no provision in there that says the executive branch has the right to determine that some people are not protected under the Constitution. So are we going to kill U.S. citizens on U.S. soil? Well, the administration has said, no, we're not going to kill U.S. citizens domestically. Well, the administration says a lot of things just because they say it doesn't necessarily mean that that's also going to be what, what happens or doesn't happen. We certainly have killed U.S. citizens in other countries. And again, it doesn't matter if somebody is accused of treason, that person should still have access to a court of law. That person should still have access to an attorney to, to see the charges that the government has brought against him or her, to, you know, to, to be able to examine that evidence, to be able to challenge that evi evidence, to be able to defend themselves. So obviously, if we're killing people in other countries just because we think they're dangerous, that's not constitutional, right? But that's one of the things that the, especially the Justice Department has maintained. Well, if people are dangerous, then they do not have constitutional protections. But that's, that, that's a problematic statement, to say the least. So if the U.S. conducts drone strikes in Pakistan, and of course, we're not officially at war with Pakistan, right? but if we conduct drone strikes in Pakistan, are they legal as long as the Pakistani government goes along with it? So that's another really interesting question. Again, the U.S. government maintains that it is legal if the Pakistani government gives the U.S. military kind of carte blanche to operate in their country. But if you look at it from international law and international human rights law, a government, a country, does not have the right to suspend the rights of its own citizens, right? So for example, one of, the, one of the rights that we have, and again, this is an international human right, this is a right that everybody has, is the right to life, you know, and the right to due process. A government cannot take that away from you. These rights cannot be alienated, right? So the government of Pakistan cannot say, we're just gonna give up these due process rights for 100 people, 1,000 people, because the US government asks us. Right? So even though the administration claims that it is legal to conduct drone strikes in Pakistan, from the perspective of international law, this is actually not the case because Pakistan does not have the right to, to take you know, the rights of its own citizens away uh, in that sense. Um, are drone strikes legal in Yemen? So in Yemen, Yemen is clearly not a theater of war, right? So why are we killing U.S. citizens in Yemen? Right? So a few years ago, Anbar al-Awlaki, uh, a U.S. citizen, he, he was um, an imam. He was considered to be a moderate Muslim. He always spoke out for reconciliation. In fact, right after 9-11, he was still giving you know, speeches and was still addressing you know, his... Um, uh, his followers in the spirit of reconciliation. The Justice Department had invited him. You know, he was considered to be one of those leaders, one of the moderate leaders uh, from the Muslim community. Well, something happened. Uh, within a few years, certainly after we went into Iraq, and he also over here e experienced the, the, uh, the backlash against Muslims. You know, so there was a Muslim woman who had been severely beaten just because she was wearing a headscarf, not because she was involved in any terrorist activities. So he was seeing that backlash, which he considered to be an attack against Muslims domestically. He didn't like that we went uh, into Iraq. Um, he also didn't like what was going on in Afghanistan. So over years, his rhetoric became increasingly anti-American, right? He left the country, he went to Yemen, and so Anwar, he did actually start to give sermons uh, encouraging young men to take up arms against the United States. So that part of it is not uh, in dispute, right? But 
What exactly does imminent threat mean? Is giving hateful speeches enough? Right? Normally, the government, and let's say, for example, if you have uh, hate groups, domestic hate groups, you might have supremacist groups, Normally, the government does not interfere unless there is an actual plan, right, unless there is an actual attack. So, so there is this threshold, right, between just talking and between actually planning and then acting. And in the case of Anwar, he certainly did a lot of talk, right, but there was, the government never presented any evidence that he was involved in any actual planning. So Anwar al ended up on a kill list and this is one of those rare instances where we actually found out that someone's on the kill list before he had been killed. And so the question was, well, again, why did he end up on a kill list? What's the criteria that's being used and so on? Uh, he was killed in a drone strike, even though he's a US citizen. He was killed in a drone strike in Yemen. And then several weeks later, his teenage son, born in Colorado, US citizen, who at that time was looking for his father in Yemen because he knew he was on a kill list and he wanted to connect with him and you know, maybe have a last talk, what, whatever the story may be. This teenage son then was also assassinated in a drone attack. Now this boy had absolutely no connections to terrorism. He did not post hateful speeches on the internet, right? So uh, what does that mean then that the US government says, well, we have the right to go and execute people abroad. In Yemen, I mean, we, we have no declaration of war against Yemen. We're not officially at war in Yemen. <clears throat> so again, if the Yemeni government is working with us or what has happened is the government of Yemen has even claimed responsibility for some of our drone strikes to cover things up. Uh, and I imagine also so that their own people aren't as upset. But if you go into the desert and you look at what is left of, of, the, of the wreckage, I mean, it's obviously US hardware, you know. So in that sense, we've not even, even we've not been very careful or, or very concerned about hiding it. Um, and another very concerning issue is what's going on in, in Somalia. So JSOC, there, there is a film that recently came out uh, titled Dirty Wars. Uh, Jeremy Scahill, who is a, a journalist, uh, he's been covering uh, M Middle East and Afghanistan, Pakistan for many, many years. Uh, he also went to, to Yemen and Somalia, and he also had discussions where people, um, he had one informant who actually was in JSOC who provided information to him, and that informant told him that, well, JSOC is operating in over 70 countries now. And what we're doing in Somalia is we have people, we have some of these um, um, warlords in Somalia who not that long ago used to be on our terror list, right? In other words, these are terrorists, these are bad guys, these guys have killed lots of people, and we now have them on the CIA payroll. Because if we give them a list of people to assassinate, they do it and they do our dirty war. So it's you know, this whole question of, of legality, I think, is very, very troubling. So right after 9-11, right, we're talking about seven days afterwards, a public law was passed in Congress, Public Law 107-40. And it basically says that the president, so this is the authorization to use military force, that the president can use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. So the problem with that is that there is no limit in time there is no limit in geography. In other words, this is very open-ended. This is a carte blanche, and it does not require any oversight by Congress. So this is what the, uh, the administration is using you know, as justification for uh, actions in including drone strikes. Uh, recently, there was also a so-called white paper 
uh, authored by the U.S. Department of Justice that was leaked. So this paper uh, sets forth a legal framework for considering the circumstances in which the U.S. government could use lethal force in a foreign country outside the area of active hostilities against a U.S. citizen, as was the case in Yemen, for example. And so one of the very interesting issues is that the notion of imminent attack is very much expanded in this white paper, uh, and also that it basically ignores the uh, government's responsibility to comply with international law and with international human rights uh, as well. So here is an excerpt from that, and this is w what I find highly troubling. You know, this is, this is how people end up on the kill list. The condition that an operational leader present an imminent threat of violent attack against the United States does not require the United States to have clear evidence that a specific attack on U.S. persons and interests will take place in the immediate future. The threat posed by Al-Qaeda and its associated forces demands a broader concept of imminence. Okay? Basically what the government is saying is as long as the federal government, as long as the executive, as long as the president determines that someone's dangerous, then the rest of us will just have to take the president's word for it, and there is no proof that has to be given. We're setting a bad precedent, and because we are the largest military power on the planet, the rest of the world watches what we do. And when we say, we don't need any evidence as long as we say somebody's dangerous, we have the right to kill that person, then, then yes. What about anybody else? I mean, definitely according to international law, it would not be acceptable for other countries to send their drones to, to, to kill our people or to kill their people if they, if they live over here. And I would say the main reason why it doesn't happen or it hasn't happened is because of our military might, but there is no guarantee that it will not. And the same legal justification that we use, or we're actually, we've not, we meaning the administration, has not even clearly defined what our legal justification is, sets a really, really bad precedent, uh, precedent for, for the rest of the world. And it, it also, it has basically undermined international law and human rights standards around the world. So it's, it's, it's an issue much broader than just what affects us here. It's, it's very, very troubling indeed. Yes? How is this even legal? Because like, the government is supposed to like, check some balances. How come the president can just decide to kill someone and now have like, so much evidence? So we, we have right now several um, lawsuits against the administration and also against specific individuals, for example, people operating within JSOC. And the Center for Constitutional Rights is one of the organizations that has brought several cases uh, against the government and, and also about Guantanamo, not just about drones. And basically, you know, in, so you, you have different cases and, you know, that they're at different stages in, in the process, but it is very alarming that the executive basically claims the executive is going to be a check on the executive and that that's going to be sufficient. And in court, that's the argument that the Justice Department has tried to use, right? And then oftentimes the courts will, will find against certain aspects of the argument, but oftentimes they also just roll over. And the reason being is that the trump card that is always used is national security. And if it comes down to national security, we can justify just about anything, it seems. And the executive is basically saying, this is executive prerogative. Uh, th these are decisions that the executive can make. And because it's in the name of national security, uh, no other oversight is needed. But clearly, from the position of the courts, this is troubling. And, and some courts have ruled against the government in cases. Um, you also have Congress, right? And the problem is Congress is not going to challenge the executive on this because there is not enough pushback from us, right? 
Guantanamo is highly embarrassing. Uh, Abu Ghraib was highly embarrassing. Drones, all of this happens in secret. And a lot of people, I mean, I hate to sound so callous, but a lot of people over here, quite frankly, don't care if Pakistanis or Afghanis are killed. We don't see them. We don't see them necessarily as other human beings. We don't see that, you know, for every 10 people we kill, we might be creating who knows how many potential future terrorists. Um, so, so there's just quite frankly a lack of concern. But part of the problem is also that there's a lack of information, right? So it's that whole secrecy issue that, that feeds on itself. But yes, we do have supposedly checks and balances in this government and the executive should be challenged and should be challenged rigorously on this. And a lot of the, um, uh, a, a lot of the reports from non-governmental organizations are calling for that, are calling for greater transparency and, and that's where it has to start, right? We really need to know uh, what's going on. In terms of international law, we have the 30 articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is the foundation, right? The Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights is the foundation for international human rights law. And then we have covenants, right? We have treaties that were agreed upon. And these international treaties are binding. And when the United States is a signatory to an international treaty, right, these supersede domestic law. So we are bound not only by the US Constitution, which protects due process rights, for example, right, in, in the Bill of Rights, but also by international law. So one of the covenants is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which the US did sign and ratify in Article 6. This is just very basic, right? Every human being has the right to life. This right shall be protected by law and no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his life. And again, arbitrarily, right? That's, that's the key word here. How do we assess that someone uh, deserves to, to die? Uh, we also have uh, United Nations principles on effective prevention and investigation of extra-legal, arbitrary, and summary executions. And obviously, governments shall prohibit by law all extra-legal, arbitrary, and summary executions. And here, this is a very important point. And again, we're talking about international law now. Exceptional circumstances, including a state of war or threat of war, internal political instability, or any other public emergency may not be invoked as justification for such executions. Right? And, and this, obviously, uh, we are clearly violating. We also have uh, United Nations principles on the use of force and firearms by law enforcement officials. And of course, it's, it's very similar to what applies to, let's say, uh, the police here in this country. The police, before they open fire on somebody, are supposed to warn that person, right? They're supposed to identify themselves. You know, I'm a police officer, I have a weapon. If you don't stop whatever it is you're doing, I'm gonna shoot, right? You have to give adequate warning. Obviously, if you have a drone flying over and 30 seconds later there's a drone strike, there is no adequate warning, right? So, so that's, uh, that's another issue. And international humanitarian law, basically the law of armed conflict, uh, does allow, again, if, if, if we have dangerous individuals who pose an immediate threat, yes, in self-defense, we are allowed to neutralize that person or to kill that person, but Every effort has to be made to determine whether or not that person is really a threat. If there's doubt as to whether a person is a civilian, that person has to be considered a civilian and not a combatant, right? And all feasible precautions must be taken to avoid and in any event to minimize incidental loss of civilian life. And we're just being very, very casual. You know, we call it collateral damage. We don't even uh, really talk of them as human beings. Here is an excerpt from an opening statement by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights at the 23rd session of the Human Rights Council in Geneva in May of this year. So this is just an excerpt, but you know, regarding the use of drones, the speaker said, I also continue to be profoundly disturbed at the human rights implications of the use of armed drones in the context of counterterrorism and military operations, with an increasing number of states seeking to acquire such weapons. 
The worrying lack of transparency regarding the use of drones has also contributed to a lack of clarity on the legal basis for drone strikes, as well as on safeguards to ensure compliance with the applicable international law. Moreover, the absence of transparency has created an accountability vacuum in which victims have been unable to seek redress. So that is just uh, very troubling. Moral question, does might make right? You know, some people will argue that, well, we are the most powerful military, therefore, you know, we can do whatever we want. Um, how much collateral damage is acceptable? You know, where do we draw the line? Um, what if the roles were reversed? What if other countries were to use drones to kill their enemies on U.S. soil or to kill U.S. citizens around the world? Right? And I think it's a very useful way to think about it. What would happen if the roles were reversed? And we would find it unacceptable if other countries did that to us. Right? We would consider a drone strike by another country equal to a declaration of war. This would just, it would not be tolerated, not for a minute. And the question is, you know, can we, meaning the United States, expect other countries to comply with international right norms when we, as a country, as a government, uh, choose, you know, just pick and choose whatever it is we want to comply with. So NGOs, uh, non-governmental organizations have issued uh, reports and key recommendations so very importantly, the Obama administration should disclose facts, right? We need to know who these people are who are being killed. We need to know their names. We need to know how many of them were combatants, how many of them were innocent civilians, how many children, you know. Provide information on the number and identity of people killed, but also its legal justification. Okay, the white paper from the Justice Department, that was leaked, right? There, and, and the white paper only addresses the issue of what happens if it involves U.S. citizens. We don't even know what standards apply to non-U.S. citizens. And maybe we don't want to know because if the standards for U.S. citizens are we, we can kill them just by the say-so of someone who claims they're dangerous, then you know, what, what possible standards could there be for non-citizens? So the, the administration really has to come forward and provide legal justification. Um, launch an independent and impartial investigation by the intelligence and armed services committees in Congress. That, that's the responsibility of Congress. That's the checks and balances, right? And also, if the administration comes forward with legal justification, then it's, it's easier to also challenge that in court, right? And then, of course, uh, ending government practices of secrecy and also, very importantly, provide effective remedies for victims of unlawful drone strikes. And right now, you know, if a family is killed in Pakistan or Afghanistan or Yemen, we don't apologize. We don't even give uh, reasons of why people were in a kill list or why people were killed in a signature strike. We don't explain it. We don't apologize. Their own governments don't explain it. Their own governments don't apologize. There is no compensation, right? You, you're, you're just leaving people with all their grief and they're not even getting recognition, you know, uh, uh, for, for the tragedy that has happened. So there are several NGO reports. Will I be next? U.S. drone strikes in Pakistan. That report was just released. Human Rights Watch also has a report between a drone and Al-Qaeda, looking specifically at U.S. targeted killings in Yemen. So this report is longer. Uh, it's over 100 pages. It, it's longer than the Amnesty report. And Human Rights Watch, you know, and Amnesty International also, right, have a really good reputation for doing solid research. Uh, several years ago, the American Civil Liberties Union already issued a report uh, having to do with uh, domestic surveillance. And if people are interested, uh, you, you can even Google this. Everything you ever wanted to know about drones, so that's maybe a, a write-up of two, three pages, but it includes a lot of Internet links so you might get linked to, let's say, articles from, from the New York Times or, or other news sources. You had a question. If you live in Pakistan or Afghanistan and where they're using drones on a regular basis, is there ongoing aerial surveillance that you are cognizant of? Yes. In certain sections of Pakistan, 
uh, especially Vasiristan, where the worst of it is happening? Yes, it's, it's daily. It's daily. But this is, is, are these things that you actually see? Yes. So you see them, you hear them. I mean, if it's in the middle of the night, then you just hear them, right? So basically, and, and I'm really glad you, you brought up this point, because basically we have an entire generation of Pakistanis who now suffer from post-traumatic stress because they are constantly listening to the sound of drones and they know that periodically a drone strike is going to hit somebody who had nothing to do with Al-Qaeda, who was just out in the field harvesting, you know, vegetables, whatever. And, and so that's a real, that's a real issue. And, and the kids, especially the kids, are really being traumatized by this. I mean, it, adults as well, but it's especially uh, traumatic for, for the kids. It, it's a catastrophe. And, you know, people don't realize how, how invasive that can be. To see a foreign military operating every day in your territory, it's uncomfortable. And I can only imagine what it's like to, to basically experience, this, experience that as a threat to your life on a daily basis. And, that, and that's what people are coping with. And that's why I think it's important for all of us in this country to, to care enough to hold the government accountable. It, again, sadly, I don't think we're going to get rid of drones, but we have to make sure that the way in which they're used and, and I mean, the, what goes on in, in, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, it's not just a, a legal question, it, it, it's also from a hum, just plain humanitarian point of view. It's a disaster what we're doing over there. It really is, yeah. How much actual American support is there for using drones? So like, the American people, the government is supposed to buy the people, so how, like, how do people actually support the use of drones? I have no idea what it is in numbers. Um, I do know that it's a problem that the program is so secret. And I do think it's a problem that the president will address us as people living in the United States and the president will address the United Nations and with a straight face say that we are targeting terrorists and that it, it's a very narrowly defined program and that it's, it's a program that is kept on a tight leash because that is actually not the case. So the government is like exposed to the people and yet it's kept so secret. Like, right. They don't know what's going on and yet he says it's weak. And I really, and like who actually supports it? You know, I think a lot of people support it because they do believe that drones are going to keep us safer. And I think especially people who do have family members in the armed services think it's better than having my son stationed, it's better than having boots on the ground in a place where then my son or daughter is going to get killed or blown to pieces or whatever. I think the reason why so many people are complacent is because they just really don't understand how, one, how illegal it is and, and how much in violation of international law it is, but also how potentially damaging this is. And, and you can look at that, again, from a national security perspective. Um, and, and also, I mean, our, our reputation internationally. Ever since 9-11, and then what happened with Guantanamo and so on, we've really lost a lot of our standing in the international community. Like going into Iraq in 2003, we've lost a lot of credibility. And that, in the long run, is going to be harmful. You know, in these endless wars and these endless kill lists, in the long run, that's going to be harmful to, to, to our security. But I mean, that, that's me talking from a human rights perspective. You're going to have some people on the hawkish end of the spectrum who will claim that it's absolutely necessary in order to keep us safe and secure. Uh, I challenge that assumption. I don't believe that is true. But um, if you are interested in finding out what some organizations have been doing, if you go to those websites, you can do a keyword search within those websites about drones or extrajudicial killings. So there are two of them that I have listed. I want to show you this. I talked a little bit about Anwar. This is his father. So, you know, his son wa was killed, but again, his son did propagate a certain amount of hate rhetoric, but his grandson was also killed. And, and this is what, what he had to say about it. We only target Al-Qaeda and its associated forces. And even then, the use of drones is heavily constrained. My grandson was killed on Friday. I 
اثنين وكلوت بيهم يمنيت يمن تايم I never thought that one day this boy, this nice boy, will be killed by his own government for no wrong he did. How can you know a 16-year boy will do anything wrong against anybody? My grandson Abdurrahman was a very nice boy. You know, if you look at his pictures when he was young. In America, you know, it's a picture of a good, you know, nice boy. He was born in August 1995 in the state of Colorado, city of Denver. He was raised in America when he was a child until he was seven years old. I never thought that uh, something like this would ever happen, but it happened, and, and especially from uh, the United States of America, who only Two weeks before that, killed my son Anwar. And he was killed in a place called Azan, which was more than 400 kilometers from the place where his father was killed. So for me and for my wife and my whole family, uh, we were really in a very sad situation, and we are st still suffering until today. So, I hope that any American will look to what happened to my grandson as some injustice. And they would, should really talk against something like this. And you can find that on the website of the Center for Constitutional Rights. And again, that organization has taken uh, the government to, to court over numerous uh, uh, violations of, of the U.S. Constitution. I want to thank you very much for giving me this hour of your day, and I hope you found it um, stimulating, hopefully it got you to, to think. And, you know, the, the way I look at it is this is our government, and even, even those of us who are not U.S. citizens, I mean, the government acts on our behalf, and it is therefore very important that we as people living in this country hold the government accountable. So I, I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to speak out. And thanks again for coming.